So here the plan is. First, we shall be, talk, we shall be discussing how to cool atoms to low temperatures and how to trap those atoms. Also, we shall speak about uh, degenerate uh, Fermi gases, degenerate Bose gases, and of course, uh, to make system interesting, we shall speak about atom-atom interactions. And all, the, all those four topics, uh, they are very much interconnected, so I will be, uh, I will be jumping between uh, them during uh, my both lectures. And I will try to speak about current uh, challenges, challenges in the field. Uh, also, I will talk about uh, the mistakes pe uh, people uh, made during such studies. Uh, uh, and I will discuss those misconceptions because uh, discussing mistakes, it's, uh, I hope you will see, it's um, very good for science. Making, uh, making a great uh, mistake uh, is a talent, and from mistake, it's, um, it is possible to learn a lot. And as an example, and first, before going to ultra-cold atoms, I will give an example of such a historical mistake so that uh, you can uh, look at uh, this uh, great uh, person and not be afraid of making mistakes and even publish those mistakes. Uh, after the discovery of superconductivity, there were lots of effort to, to find the right theory. And one such theory was written uh, by, uh, by Ralph Kronig. Here, the title of the paper from 1932 was very simple. The theory of superconductivity, just in German. And the theory was, his idea was that at low temperature, electrons build up um, into a crystal. And this crystal is uh, sliding through ionic lattice uh, without um, uh, friction. Of course, he, he was asked uh, what's about scattering, and he was saying this is a crystal, and uh, individual sc sc scattering is inhibited because uh, this crystal is rigid. Of course, today we know that this theory is incorrect. But this incorrect theory, late it, it evolved. Just two years later, Maybe this is Theory of superconductivity. <laughs> uh, uh, quite possible, quite possible. Uh, so, uh, two years later, Wigner came up with the theory of what uh, currently is known as Wigner crystals or uh, Coulomb crystals. Indeed, charged particles, they form, they form a lattice. And this is uh, an image from a recent experiment. Those are um, dusty uh, particles particles of dust. Each particle has a um, uh, pretty large uh, charge on the order of 1,000 Coulomb. And um, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, on the order of 1,000 th um, electron charges. 1,000 Coulomb is too much. 1,000 uh, electron charge, and they indeed form a lattice. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. And um, uh, even historically, uh, initially, this paper was written by Kronik together with um, Niels Bohr. But Niels Bohr heard criticism and has withdrawn himself from uh, an author's. Yes, please. Uh, could you give more description about this experiment? Because it's, they're not, uh, they're probably some external potential, right? Yes, yes. The, uh, this uh, uh, this experiment uh, those are this is in plasma so there are uh, lots of uh, dust particles heavy dust particles um, uh, you know, put into uh, into the plasma they are surrounded by electrons so this system is electrically neutral right. this system is electrically neutral the kinetic energy you know, of uh, those dust particles is very small Therefore, uh, the kinetic energy is uh, almost two orders of magnitude uh, smaller than um, the, potential, um, uh, the potential energy of the Coulomb interaction. And in this situation, uh, parti uh, particles form a crystal. So that's, uh, uh, so, so th th this, uh, this, uh, this mistake evolved uh, then into uh, existing physical system. And the uh, Kronig initially was going to publish with Bohr, but Bohr has uh, later has uh, withdrawn uh, his name, and uh, Kronig uh, persisted and published alone. Okay, so now let's go to uh, 
now let's go to ultra low temperatures. Uh, how to uh, produce low temperatures? Uh, currently, the lowest temperatures uh, are produced by means of lasers. So a laser, uh, laser does not only heat up, it can, uh, it can uh, remove energy. And uh, the story began, uh, the story of uh, cooling uh, atomic gases began uh, back in uh, 1981 in the city of Troitsk. It's uh, near, near Moscow to the uh, uh, about 10 kilometers to the west of Moscow. Uh, the group of uh, Vladilian Litohov did the first experiment uh, on uh, cooling a beam of sodium <coughs> atoms. It was just cooling in it was cooling just in one dimension. So many years passed since 1981. Uh, this is the title from that historical paper. Uh, many years passed since uh, 1981. Troitsk is now a part of a bigger city. Troitsk now is not existing as a city, it's a part of Moscow. And laser cooling it's used in thousands of laboratories uh, in the world. Here the story started with uh, sodium. The uh, atoms which are cooled by now, it's uh, all alkali uh, metals. The, I'm uh, not in the metal, um, uh, of course, uh, stage uh, they are cooled um, as a vapor. So vapors of alkali metals, silver, metastable noble gases, group two elements, and cro chromium. So it's uh, many elements, but it's much less than the whole uh, Mendeleev table. Uh, what's, um, uh, what should be noted about gases which can be cooled? First, uh, very well established uh, clear spectrum is needed. Better spectrum which is uh, reminiscent to the spectrum of hydrogen. And second, spectral lines uh, which are accessible by lasers. Like you can see, hydrogen is not uh, in this list because hydrogen requires lasers at the wavelength of 122 nanometers. It's uh, it's too ex it's too extreme. But the, the first the first two lines they're all like hydrogen. Metastable helium. It means uh, it's uh, helium is not uh, in uh, helium electrons are not uh, all in the in the first orbit. One electron is excited to two s orbit. Formally, it's an excited state, but in this state, electron lives um, uh, approximately uh, two hours. So it's like uh, helium in this excited state. It's like uh, it's almost like an atom in a ground state, and in this state, it is cooled. The lowest temperatures are half a nano kelvin now, and. Um, uh, but what's pecu peculiar about those gases? They can be qu become quantum degenerate. They can feel. Um, they can develop coherence. But and this is despite extreme diluteness. The typical distance between um, the particles in a gas is one micron. Appreciate one micron. It's it is a lot because here in the air it's three nanometers between the particles, and the air is pretty dilute. And uh, this is 300 times, uh, almost 1,000 times uh, more, more dilute. OK, now let's go into the physics of, let's go into the physics of making low temperatures. Actually, it's a photograph of a laboratory. And each, uh, each optical element uh, on the optical table, it has some physics behind. If you those big boxes, like this blue box, this blue box, this white box, all those are lasers. And laser coolant happens in the vacuum chamber, which is very far behind. The close-up on the vacuum chamber is here. And if you look into one of those uh, ports, into glass ports, uh, to look into the vacuum chamber, you may see when experiment is on. This is an image of uh, a cloud of um, uh, atoms in the preliminary stage of cooling. It's not very ultra cold yet. So this is a uh, this is um, uh, this is glass port, and this uh, white cloud. It's uh, um, it's a cloud of approximately one billion of atoms. First, they are so far on this image they are pretty hard, pretty hot. One, uh -huh, yes, please. Um, I was wondering, this one micrometer proximity of the atoms, is that the closest they can get? 
uh, they can, uh, I, it is possible to, um, uh, to put them much farther apart. Nothing physically prohibited, uh, neither technically nor physically. It is also possible uh, to bring them uh, closer, like uh, 100 nanometers. Uh, if you start bringing even closer, there is physics which prohibits to do that. At least, th at least there is physics um, uh, which uh, prohibits to keep this gas stable. And I should come to this physics uh, by the end of either today's uh, lecture or in the beginning of tomorrow. I hope not to forget about uh, clo close the distances. Thank you very much for this question. OK, so uh, first, uh, the cloud of atoms, one millimeter in size. Still pretty hot, one, one millikelvin. And experts or just uh, curious people should note the, the fact that the cloud is white, it is unphysical. I hope you, uh, you will see that uh, being white here on the, uh, for the cloud of atoms is unphysical. I hope you will see that from the next few slides. Okay, let's get closer to the physics. And le let's consider an example of laser coolant. Uh, Initial understanding can be done in the approximation of a two-level atoms. Just this is ground state, this is excited state. So it's just same as uh, qubit uh, system as um, uh, Walter was um, uh, di was discussing uh, in the morning. There is optical transition between uh, between uh, this um, uh, these two states for. Uh, I will be a lot. I will be referring to uh, to the element lithium. It's number three in the periodic table. It's uh, uh, it's very important, and I hope you will uh, by the end of um, uh, by the middle of today's lecture you will appreciate the importance of lithium. There is a transition at 670 nanometers, so it is red color. Red color. Notice. In the vacuum chamber inside, everything glows red. It's scattering of the red color lasers, which are used for laser cooling. Specific frequency of the uh, laser should be chosen. So consider, this is the wavelength for the transition, 670 nanometers. And then let's tune the frequency of the laser a little bit below the transition, so that uh, this, is, this is the key fe feature. Frequency of the, la of the laser is a little bit below the, tra uh, the transition. So that when atom is uh, not moving, not moving, it's infinitely cold, stationary. It's not resonant with the laser. But as the atoms move towards um, uh, the laser beam, uh, due to the Doppler effect, the atom comes into the, in into the resonance with the laser. Resonance means uh, the atom is absorbing a photon. Each photon carries momentum. So atom is absorbing photons. It's uh, receiving momentum, which is uh, stopping the atom. And um, of course, after, um, after momentum is uh, absorbed by the, uh, uh, by the atom, of course, uh, uh, the photon is um, later is irradiated um, away. And, uh, but uh, photons are radiated into the random directions. But the light is absorbed uh, into one uh, particular chosen direction. This way, if atom were moving to, to, uh, opposite to the laser beam, this way the atom would be stopped. That's qualitative physics. We, sh uh, we should go to quantities um, uh, very soon. Okay, so, so this was the way to stop, uh, stop motion in one direction. Then uh, let's. Uh, Let's choose uh, some uh, volume in space and irradiate it by six laser beams. Wherever the atom goes, well, first, if, the a if this atom were moving uh, collinear with the beam, if uh, the atom were moving same direction as uh, the laser beam, this atom would not feel any pressure from the laser. Because if atom is moving away due to the Doppler shift, this laser frequency feels even smaller. So only atom is only sensitive to the beams which are opposite to the motion of the atom. 
Now we shine by six laser, laser beams. Wherever the atom is uh, moving for each projection, Vx, v, Vy, Vz, uh, there is a beam which will be stopping this uh, projection of the velocity. So maybe this would work. And this, this even works, but it, this is not enough for laser cooling. I, I'm sorry, this is eno enough for laser cooling, but this is not enough for trapping. Because I was announcing a cloud of atoms. So they should be all together. Cool, uh, uh, nothing is perfect. So cooling, uh, uh, even if there, there were laser, even if there is laser cooling, some small velocity, remnant velocity remains, and the atom would be drifting away from the cooling region. Here, even more has been done by the year 1987. It was possible to create the center of attraction so that atoms are attracted into, into some point in space. These six beams are only needed uh, to um, slow down the velocity. But one more thing is important to the progress in uh, ultra cold atoms and even for degenerate atoms. It should be an attraction point in space. By the way, use your telephones to photograph the slides of the speaker. If you are talking to your friends, well, the you speakers here just provide their slides uh, to, for publication. Hmm? Normally, speakers here just provide their slides for further publication. I'll be glad to. Okay. I discourage people to talk to their friends via, the, uh, via WhatsApp or Viber, <laughs> despite listen, uh, listening to the speaker. So, how to create uh, so how to create attraction point in space? Here, for creating an attraction point in space, the two-level uh, two atom approximation is not enough. Let's go more complicated. We shall be increasing complexity of the system step by step. So this is two-level atom idea is not enough. We need four levels. Ground state remains the same, but for the ex excited state we need magnetic substates which are sensitive to the magnetic field due to the Zeeman effect. So the, the excited state, it, let's say it has, a, it has an angular momentum one, therefore there are three substates. The middle one is not needed. Uh, the, uh, the two on the edges are needed. If we apply magnetic field, the energy of those states projection plus one and projection plus minus one, the energy would change to change proportional to the magnetic field. By the way, let's enter, let's start entering numbers. The, the, the change in the energy, the, the energy shift is approximately Bohr magneton times the magnetic field. So the quantities are the Bohr magneton, it's approximately 1.6 megahertz per gauss. The, field, the magnetic fields you see in your, uh, in your life is um, yeah, magnetic field around us, magnetic field of the Earth is half a gauss. The magnetic field in uh, magnetic resonance imaging devices is, uh, um, is approximately 10,000 gauss several tens of thousands of gauss. Here we would need uh, fields of the order of, uh, of a few gauss. Uh, could you also translate megahertz to kelvins? To kelvins? That's tricky. Uh, wait, I, I think I know. I think 20 shirts. 20 shirts is one Nano Kelvin. So those megahertz we shall deal with. It's well above that. Uh, well above the temperatures uh, we are looking for to get. Okay. So how how we shall use this magnetic field? Uh, let's say there is on this graph. This is the uh, this is the axis uh, along um, the this uh, this is uh, some di some direction in space. Let's let's call it z. Let's apply gradient of magnetic field. 
so that um, in the point of in the point where we are going to make a trap the magnetic field is zero but uh, wherever we are going from uh, from this uh, point of attraction magnetic field grows linearly so this at z equals zero we shall have our trap the two uh, the two magnetic substates with opposite projections minus one and plus one they will behave differently in this linearly varying magnetic field so projection plus one would grow with the field which grows linearly with that, with the coordinate projection minus one would decrease and our we still apply laser field those six beams and still uh, it is tuned below the transition in atom the the field of the laser what happens if the atom is absolutely cold it has zero velocity but the atom is far away from the from far away from the trap center let's say the atom is uh, at this co this coordinate let's look what uh, the energy of a state uh, excited state mj minus 1 is the energy of this state is exactly in the res in the resonance with the atomic beam uh, with, with the, the laser beam so even a stationary atom now feels the laser field and from this way this side we irradiate field circular polarized into a sigma minus polarization so this way even a stationary atom is pushed by this beam towards the center from the opposite side we sign the opposite polarization sigma plus sigma plus polarization does not excite transition from a uh, from ground state to mj minus one this is the ground state this is unneeded state mj equals one the needed state mj equals plus one and the state mj equals minus one so sigma minus light with the sigma minus polarization drives only this transition and this transition is driven by the sigma plus. So this way we create a center of attraction. A stationary atom away from the trap center is pushed in. And uh, those beams, they still uh, cool the atoms down. How this is done physically? Still uh, the, six, uh, the six beams Still, 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 the, still the six beams uh, uh, shine towards some um, region in space, plus we add two, uh, two magnets. This is electromagnet with the current going in one direction. This is electromagnet with the current going in the other direction. Such configuration creates a, a zero of magnetic field at this point, and wherever you go, magnetic field grows linearly. So the goal is achieved. That's achievement of 19, uh, that's achievement of 19, uh, that's achievement of, of 1997. Okay, turned off my phone. Uh, that's that's achievement of 1997 by um, uh, Stephen Chu and Bill Phillips, the Nobel Prize winners for you know, for, for laser cooling. So this way, those are the principles of um, uh, getting low uh, getting low temperatures and um, yeah. uh, and just qualitative explanation now let's uh, uh, go a little bit deeper into the theory and uh, be amazed that uh, how come this uh, became working the theory dates back to 1977 Let's consider that just the simplest situation from the beginning. No magnetic field so far, just uh, two cooling beams from the opposite directions which interact with the atoms. The force which acts on the atoms from interaction with the light can be considered as a viscous force. This is the force versus the, the velocity of the atoms. 
Of course, the force peaks um, at the Doppler shift where the atoms come into the resonance with some specific ve velocities. And one can calculate the, the amount of the, of the force. Of course, the force is proportional to h bar k. K is here is the wave vector of um, k is the wave vector of light. H bar k is momentum transferred to to, uh, to the atom in a single act of um, the absorption of a photon. Of course, the force depends on the intensity of laser radiation. Here, these are two uh, terms. This 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 term is the force from the Beam, beam, from the beam going uh, in from this direction, this is the term from uh, from the beam go going into this direction. And let's and let's try plugging in the numbers. By the way, importantly, gamma equals gamma. It's the lifetime. Gamma is uh, the lifetime of the uh, inverted lifetime of the excited state. So typically, okay, I'll keep writing numbers. Gamma is typically 10 megahertz. Delta here is the detunion between it's this detunion between the laser, uh, the laser frequency and the uh, and the, uh, the transition to the excited state. Let's try to plug in the numbers. Oh, first, uh, one more result of this theory. Which, uh, which temperature can be achieved by this process of absorption and uh, absorption of re emission of light? Actually, the atoms are in a, in a viscous force, at the lowest, um, in the lo lowest velocity region. Uh, in, the, in this region, the force is linear in, uh, in velocity. So th 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 this is a viscous force. And um, uh, also, the, um, a each atom experiences a random force. In addition to the viscous force, there is a random force. Because after photon is absorbed, the photon is emitted. And as the photon is emitted, uh, the atom uh, feels uh, a recoil. Uh, the evolution in velocity space um, uh, governs by the Fokker-Planck equation. And solution to the Fokker-Planck equation with a viscous force and um, with a random force and the random force is Maxwell velocity uh, ma is the Maxwell velocity distribution. So indeed, the atoms thermalize um, uh, thermalize to real thermal distribution, and this is the temperature achieved. Now it is called. Uh, uh, well, the theory was uh, written by these three people. It's called now in the literature the Doppler force, the smallest. The smallest temperature is achieved when the detunion delta equals half a, half a gamma, half of the width of the excited state. And let's plug in the numbers. First, let's calculate the minimal temperature achievable uh, by this um, cooling with a resonant laser light. For the lithium, I claimed is very important. It's approximately 150 microKelvin for rubidium, which was used in the first experiment on Bose-Einstein condensation. It's the same 150 microKelvin. But let's look at one more scale, where the viscous force is the strongest. The viscous force is the strongest if uh, the resonance velo velo velocity uh, if the detu if the detunion is a half of the excited state lifetime, so if we pl plug in the appropriate detunion, we get uh, the viscous force. Uh, I'm sorry, the resonance frequency and temperature based on this resonance frequency, just 1.4 millikelvin. So for atoms, so the temperature of 1.4 millikelvin, the cooling force is the strongest. It's not a big step. It's a very small step in the temperature, which is going from uh, 1.4 millikelvin to 150 microkelvin. is not is not that big achievement. What all this laser cooling is about? Of course, it's it's the temperature for which uh, 
the, the viscous force peaks, if we go farther away from, uh, from this resonant velocity, of course, the force is smaller. But still, there is cooling force. So you can go, uh, you can go from this maximum uh, capture velocity to high velocity, but not uh, by this much, say, uh, by a factor of 2, 3, 4. So uh, the question appears, from which temperature we can cool atoms down to this nice 150 microkelvin? It's not that big uh, temperature. It occurred to be, uh, of course, not as small as one point, not as small and tragic as 1.4 millikelvin I wrote here for lithium, but it's uh, on the order of uh, Kelvin at most. So it's not, it's not, not that much is achieved. How come laser cooling became this popular? This is because uh, one more tool was used. This is because one more tool was uh, was used, and this made uh, laser cooling very practical. How to achieve these pre-cooled temperatures, not as low as 1.4 milli? Uh -huh, yes, please. Uh, question. Uh, so you say that the delta, the detunion, is equals minus gamma divided by two, and it means that some of the population from the ground state can go to the excited state exactly because the gamma is the uh, width of the excited state, so we can uh, populate the excited state. It means that uh, maybe, gamma sh uh, maybe delta should be more than gamma or two gammas or something. Uh, a very important point. Even stationary atom, absolutely cold atom, and uh, can, uh, can, be uh, can go to the excited state. Uh, but uh, still, uh, statistically, it goes uh, many, many, t it still g gets excited, but during those excitations, it still goes into, uh, into, ve into velocity, which, is, uh, which corresponds to this uh, lowest temperature. Uh, so it means that uh, Doppler cooling is uh, going on this, uh, even with this delta? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, even with small, any, any negative detunion brings about cooling. Mm -hmm. Of course, practically, practically, uh, uh, significant, very often, significantly bigger detunion is chosen. What we pay for that? Uh, the, uh, the cost is that if we increase detunion, See, the, the lowest achievable temperature goes up. But it goes up linearly with detunion. Linearly means not that much. The benefit from bigger detunion is that we increase this resonance velocity where the cooling force is the strongest. And see, the capture temperature it is quadratic in resonance velocity and this quadratic in detunion. So in terms of, uh, it is possible to intercept a bigger velocity population at cool. And as you see, uh, maybe in about 15 minutes, reaching uh, not 150 microkelvin, but somewhat bigger number, say millikelvin, is not that bad because the cooling will continue. But now, now I will go from the opposite side. How to, how to uh, take atoms which are hot and bring them to the pretty low temperatures around say, 150 microkelvin. Uh, so please uh, appreciate the numbers. We need to reach 150 microkelvin or a few hundred microkelvin, not starting from uh, tens of millikelvin. We are starting from molten metal not molten, evaporated from uh, uh, vapors of a metal. It's typical temperature 300 Kelvin for rubidium or cesium or 1000 Kelvin for lanthanoids. Lanthanoids are very important. They are used in uh, precision atomic clocks. How to, how to pre-cool uh, the atoms? Well, sometimes if, uh, uh, if a metal is uh, with very abundant vapors like like for 
rubidium it is sufficient to cool for um, uh, it is sufficient to uh, to capture all, only small fraction of velocity distribution because uh, the vapor has a very large density already and uh, it is possible to uh, uh, to trap enough atoms but for lithium or lanthanoids which uh, have very low pressure of vapor atomic beams are used and this is that first experiment on cooling of atomic beam of uh, cooling atomic beam done by Litohov and uh, his colleagues back in 1981 they say, it is important that in laser cooling as atom decelerates it uh, comes in a, into, re into resonance with the light and stop deceleration so if we take hot atoms uh, which uh, rush uh, opposite to the laser beam as they stopped a little bit they um, uh, they will continue with this uh, velocity because they will not be uh, uh, they will not be cool cooled down anymore so the approach is to uh, start cooling from some high temperature and uh, then uh, uh, keep uh, uh, keep increasing uh, the frequency of the laser so that it matches uh, the resonance condition and this is what was done in that historical experiment in 1981. This is the distribution of, uh, distribution of uh, atoms in atomic beam. And this is that sharp peak which uh, appeared and it is shifted from uh, the center of the atomic beam. And this is that cold fraction which is not very cold but it's enough to capture into magnet optical trap. Next important step was done by Harold Metcalf and uh, uh, Bill Phillips. They used, um, they created an atomic beam which was now possible to operate all the time continuously, not by chirping uh, the laser frequency like, like Litohov was done. They decided, oh, let's vary the distance between, uh, let's, let's vary the distance between uh, the levels in the atom as uh, the at the beginning, as the atom is fused from the oven at the speed of uh, almost 1,000 meters per second, they apply a magnetic field which um, stretches uh, away the two states of the atom to match the resonance condition. And then, the atoms, as the atoms slow down along the beam, the magnetic field is vanishing. And that's the practical way to create uh, cold atomic beams, which are not which is now used. So typically, this is um, a source of atomic beam which goes through the what is called Zeeman slower that uh, uh, that apparatus back from 1982, and uh, then slow atoms are collected into magnet optical trap. So this is good, but still it is far from degeneracy. Let's try to. Um, address the question whether the magnetic, magnet optical trap um, yeah, is capable of reaching uh, degeneracy like degenerate Fermi gases, degenerate Bose gases, and the answer will be no. But let's see, uh, let's indeed see from uh, elementary theory that uh, it, is, um, uh, it is not possible. So the answer, the phase space density is uh, this number cubed. Delta E x is typical distance between the atoms. Delta P is uh, uh, it's the, the typical momentum spread. And the number is uh, 0.01, which means the phase sp space density is 10 to negative 6. What limits we have here? Let's see. First handle to tune is momentum spread. We have momentum spread from the litohov minogin public limit, which I wrote before. It's half of the excited state life uh, line width divided by two, typically 100 microkelvin. Can we go lower? You know that uh, the width of the, the life of the excited state, uh, it is different from, uh, for different atoms, for different states. Here I deliberately was using uh, the excited state with a uh, width of 10 megahertz but of course you know that there are narrow narrow transitions such transitions with even subhertz width 
which are used uh, in the uh, in the optical clocks. Or remember, I mentioned excited metastable state of helium. That transition has width one over two hours. Why not to use those narrow transitions in laser cooling? And this way, we can plug in very small momentum spread delta p, and this way get a, a very uh, and 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 and, the, and this um, I'm sorry get not uh, not small but high m momentum spread delta p, and this way w this uh, this way we shall we shall get a very um, very high phase space densities. Well, you know the Mersbauer effect. There should be in a as a as a photon is uh, absorbed or recoiled, an atom is receiving some momentum. And Mersbauer effect it prevents uh, uh, gamma quanta from being absorbed by a free atom. The atom has to be in a lattice to absorb. Uh, the atom has to be in the lattice to um, absor absorb um, a, qua a, a gamma quantum, a photon. Uh, so the, the, the con here there is similar condition. There should be the, the width of the excited state has to be bigger than the recoil energy. The energy that a stationary atom receives from a photon when the photon is emitted. That's one limit. The other limit is that atoms are pushing on each other. There is a repulsive force inside the, inside the cloud. If, if an, a, an atom absorbs a photon, and then the atom re-emits this photon, and then this photon is absorbed by a neighbor, and this um, actually creates a pressure on, um, on the, on the, of the neighbors on each other. And this radiation force can be even computed. So how to, or better to say, estimated. This is the force exerted on an atom uh, by, um, by, uh, by the photons, um, uh, by the photons which are emitted by the other atoms. So this force, it's the cr absorption cross-section times uh, the intensity of the scattered light. So let's say. This is, a, this is some imaginary cir circles. There are atoms here. They are emitting photons. And this is one atom on the surface of this sphere. And uh, this atom is feeling this radiation force I'm talking about. And how much force, how much intensity is scattered by those atoms which are inside this circle? It is still uh, the in, it is the intensity falling on the cloud of atoms, times the, the absor absorption cross section times the number of atoms, and divided by the area of this uh, circle. And it occurs that uh, here this n is uh, big n is the total number and little n is uh, the density. And it occurs the scattering rate is proportional to the size of to the size of this atomic cloud so the the force is proportional to proportion proportional to r to the ra to the radius to the distance from the center and one can ca calculate also the trapping force and the trapping force it is like the spring force mm. it is like the spr spring force it, it appears from the same uh, Litokhov Minogin public theory, which I announced before. Let's look at qualitative picture. The trapping force appears because of the linear gradient of the magnetic field, which makes uh, the, the excited states uh, to vary linearly. So the trapping force is linear. We can equate two forces the radiation pressure force, which pu pushes the atoms away, and the trapping force and get the density from this force. And here, the density, you should just look at the dimensions. K squared, it's, uh, the, it's uh, the wave vector of light. 
and D it's a typ typical amount of variation of uh, the energy it's uh, it's the space over which uh, uh, over which uh, the energy of the excited state shifts by the amount of gamma and by requiring phase space density one by requiring degeneracy it means that uh, appreciably uh, the energy of the excited state should be uh, should vary on a very small uh, scale just uh, three uh, less than uh, one angstrom 0.3 angstroms which requires huge magnetic fields so to get degeneracy to get quantum degeneracy in magnetic optical trap absolutely uh, impos impossible magnetic field gradients are needed such gradients of the magnetic field 10 to the 7 te tesla per meter it's possible only on the neutron stars so the answer is degeneracy is not possible in magnet optical trap the, this approach to cooling which I told you about it can be used only as a first stage of cooling to pre-cool one more procedure is needed to reach degeneracy next step we shall talk how to go to uh, how to uh, prepare firm degenerate fermi gases degenerate bose gases bose condensates here is the next step on the first step let's say we achieve temperatures 150 micro kelvin or something which i announced before how to go how to go how to go further down in the temperature before that in the first stage the resonant laser light was our friend when we go lower resonant laser light is our enemy so resonant laser light should be removed on the second stage of cooling on the second stage of cooling when we reach degeneracy we use completely opposite approach the light should be completely off a resonant but the trap for the atoms in this stage is very simple the trap is just focus of a laser beam so this is this is a laser beam which focuses and this is in the focus the atoms are trapped of course this trap is not very large but the advantage is it is very conservative despite this is electromagnetic radiation the uh, the rate of elastic processes is uh, approximately one per hour by the way the trapping force the trapping potential it is minus uh, dipole moment of the atoms of the atom times the electric field in the laser of course the, the electric field is varying but in the atom we start with spherically symmetrical atom and the dipole moment it is edu induced dipole moment so the dipole moment is polarizability times the electric field so we plug, plug in this expression into the potential and we get that mm, the, pot uh, the potential is just proportional to electric field square which means trapping potential is intensity of the laser the laser is the most uh, the laser beam is the most intense in the focus and this is why this is point of attraction actually uh, to achieve uh, and in this trap it is possible to achieve nano kelvin range temperatures and it is interesting that uh, to achieve those nano kelvin uh, 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 level temperatures we use uh, uh, powerful lasers like carbon dioxide lasers in the factories those lasers are used to cut steel and here it is a very conservative trap to to hold very frag fragile gas of atoms okay but uh, so we know here how to hold the atoms very unperturbatively but how to cool them how to remove energy and the answer is evaporation so this is potential energy of the trap this bluish curve and the atoms collide they call uh, first uh, the trap has finite depth which means 
if we have a thermal distribution of atoms, it does not, it, it cannot fit into the trap. So let's say we have thermal distribution of atoms. Number of atoms with a given velocity. So this is velocity which equals square root of the trap depth, which means the atoms in this tail cannot be held in the trap. They fly away. Then the atoms collide, collide with each other, and then again fill up this uh, uh, tail of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And again, uh, fly, and again fly away. But um, when the, this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is developed, on each step, it is developed for lower and lower temperatures. Because most energetic atoms fly away. Those atoms which fly away, away they are very few, but they carry lots of energy because they are from the tail. And here the question is, it is related to that, que to that statement in the beginning that the distance between the atoms is very large, let's say one micron. How do those atoms collide? They are one micron apart. Typical size of uh, the atom is 10 to the negative uh, centimeter. It's 0.1 nanometer. How, how do they see each other one micron, apart, uh, one micron apart? How do they collide? And at this point, that's a very important question, how they collide. I will have to postpone this question until I discuss uh, the interactions in ultra-cold gases. Indeed, such experiment on uh, ev evaporative cooling was done. It means they collide, but it's, it, it is important to, ad to understand how, how they collide. So uh, further consideration of uh, how the, the lowest temperatures I achieved, I will postpone. But I will try to show that uh, oh, bef bef before I continue with the next topic, it may be asked, uh, how do those two traps coexist? Magneto-optic trap with resonant light, and how the atoms are loaded into, uh, into the focus of a laser beam. That's very straightforward an experiment. At some stage, they co coexist. This is the vacuum chamber. And the red, red uh, lines, those are the beams uh, for, uh, for the on resonance light. And the, that single focused laser, which is, forms the dipole trap in, in, the foc in the focus, it just goes through the magneto-optic trap. And then those beams for magneto-optic trap are just uh, turned off, and the atoms are held in th this non-invasive focus of a laser beam and uh, further cooled down. At this point, let me discuss Let's suppose the lowest temperatures I achieved. And let me show you first the proof of degeneracy. And then later, in about maybe 20 minutes, I will start explaining how this final stage of cooling is done. Because to understand cooling, uh, we need to understand the in interactions. OK, how to observe cold, cold atoms, and how to measure that their temperature is very low indeed. The observation is very straightforward, just photographing. How to photograph those atoms? Okay, let's say this is a cigar-shaped cloud of atoms, just from a focus of laser beam. And um, let's shine on a resonance light to this beam of atoms. If we shine on a resonance light, this light is scattered by the cloud. And the shadow forms behind the cloud. And we can just project this uh, shadow on a charge coupled device, or CCD camera, or just uh, uh, dig dig digital camera like in the telephone, but very low noise, digital camera. Of course, there should be some projective optics between the cloud of atoms and the uh, CCD array, but I omit that. It's important that the atoms make a shadow. 
and from this shadow it is possible to completely reconstruct the density distribution of the cloud. And that's actual image from the experiment. The reconstruction is very straightforward. Let's say we shine a beam and locally there is some distribution of atoms with a density n and then initial intensity the intensity which passes through it equals initial intensity i naught e to minus n sigma l sigma it's absorption cross section it's known l l is not known n density of atoms is not known so n times l so two dimensional uh, so integral of the density along one direction it can be it can be reconstructed from such photograph so uh, this is actually cloud of atoms in atomic beam you can see actual dimensions here in microns here as you uh, as you may be noted uh, the wavelength of the laser of the laser was very long 10.6 microns which means uh, the focus of the, la of the laser beam is pretty large, it's hundreds of microns. So it's pretty sizable trap. And how to judge the temperature? For a classical gas, this would be very straightforward. Don't photograph in the trap. Turn off the trap and let the, let the cloud expand. And uh, you know how long it expanded, uh, the warmer the cloud is, the faster it expands. And from the size of the cloud after expansion, it is possible to calculate the temperature straightforwardly. With degenerate gases, it's very different. At zero temperature, Fermi gas has energy. So the expansion is not a way of measuring temperature. Because see, at um, zero temperature, fermions, they occupy um, uh, one, two fermions per, per energy level. Two fermions because they have a, I consider them in two spin states. Which, which means even at zero temperature, uh, even at zero temperature, they have kinetic energy. So measuring the expansion of atoms is not a way of judging temperature of fermions. How to find the temperature, how, how to prove that the gas is degenerate. And it is actually proved from, uh, still from the photographs. Let's consider, I'm using here data as a proof, a data from actual experiment, so I will not use cigar-shaped cloud, I will use disc-shaped clouds. Disc-shaped cloud can be achieved in a little more complex trap. It's uh, a standing wave is used, to, is used as a, to create an array of traps. These are two, two laser beams coming opposite to each other. They are collimated, so they are parallel. And uh, in the in the standing wave, there are anti-nodes where intensity is maximal, and those anti-nodes, the area which um, which attract um, which which attract uh, the atomic gas, and uh, you can photograph in this direction, perpendicular to the screen, and this is the photograph of uh, of the atoms in this series of micro traps. Each red line, each red line, it's a, it is a, it is a, a flat cloud of atoms. Then you can integrate this picture along, uh, along this direction and get distribution of, and get and get a distribution of the atom atoms in the in the trap. And actually, the shape of the trapping potential is parabolic. And let's recall the nuclear physics. By the way, do we have nuclear physicists here? Raise your hand if you are a nuclear physicist. 
Okay, nobody from nuclear physics. Okay, maybe you remember from from um, uh, from the universe to the Thomas Fermi distribution, which is widely used in the nuclear physics, may, and maybe it is uh, oftenly used in the theory of superconductivity. How to? What is it is used for? If 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 the levels in the trap are very discrete, we should account population of each level. But if the if the energy levels go very close to each other, we can integrate as if uh, the levels are very close, uh, uh, which means that mm. fermions popu populate many, many, many close levels. And uh, population at zero temperature, population stops at some energy. And uh, above, everything is empty in this potential. No states are populated. It means at zero temperature, there should be a sharp edge in the distribution of atoms in the trap. Along this direction, it's just a spatial coordinate. So sharp edge in the distribution is signature of low temperature. If the gas were the classical, the distribution of um, atoms would be Gaussian. Now let's look at the details of this density distribution of atoms in the trap. Well, with some trained eye, would see that this distribution is not exactly Gaussian. The edge is somewhat sharp. We can go quantitative. Actually, one can calculate just by filling up the occupation, uh, by summing up the occupation numbers, one cal can calculate the distribution of non-interacting fermions in a parabolic trap. And this would be uh, this uh, polylogarithm function, which is usually uh, designated as, as Li. It's not lithium, it's poly, uh, polylogarithm uh, function. And uh, at uh, high temperature T, it becomes, uh, it turns into a Gaussian. At uh, zero temperature, it turns into the sharp uh, distribution. So one can fit the data with this function. The omega, uh, the frequency of the potential is known, but T can be used as a free parameter. And by using this free parameter, uh, so by matching free parameter, you match the right curve. This black, cur black solid curve is the fit. And from the fit, you get the temperature. Of course, one can try to fit with a Gaussian, insisting that this is a classical gas. But you can see in the edges, Gaussian, this dashed, cu dashed curve, it is obviously away from the, uh, from the data. And here in the edge, it is still away. In the middle, Gaussian is a more narrow. So statistical with statistical analysis, it's just clearly a non-Gaussian distribution. That's the signature of low temperature. OK, we know already you know, you know how to measure low temperatures, but you st I still did not tell you how to uh, achieve those low temperatures. I only told you about how to achieve hundreds of microkelvin, but not nanokelvin. OK, before going to the nanokelvin temperature, let me again emphasize the role of, uh, the role of interactions and, uh, to appreciate, so that I hope you will appreciate the role of interactions when I analyze one very recent uh, misconception. Well, great minds made great mistakes, and it's very interesting to discuss those mistakes. Let's discuss the experiment which uh, deserved Nobel Prize for the, for the Bose-Einstein condensation. Actually, we're discussing the first experiment of, on Bose-Einstein condensation made by Carl, Carl Wieman, Eric Cornell, and their colleagues. This experiment was so popular uh, that uh, maybe you even see in the popular literature those uh, this uh, picture which designates Bose condensation, 
we shall uh, analyze uh, detailed analysis will be uh, maybe in 40 minutes now we shall do some preliminary analysis so this is this is uh, the, those two uh, there are three two dimensional there are, there are three three dimensional plots along the fl along the surface coordinates uh, there are just coordinates and this is bulging up coordinate it's uh, uh, the density so the authors are showing that suddenly as they lower the temperature something sharp grows in the middle we shall actually they what they photograph what they uh, what they plot what they are measuring in the experiment they analyze the image the gas after the expansion I was showing you pictures of gas in the trap. Those pictures are from 2010. This was 1995. At that time, uh, people just did not know how to uh, image uh, atoms uh, in the trap. Uh, experimental technique did not develop enough. Imaging was uh, done only after the trap was turned off and the gas expanded. So, what, what, and the picture they apparently, uh, the authors of this Nobel paper, apparently the picture they had in mind, the picture they had in mind that Bose-Einstein condensation means that all bosons get together in the lowest, in the lowest energy level. This was the picture by Einstein from uh, 1925 that uh, in Bose-Einstein condensation all atoms are in the lowest energy levels and they looked at the expansion of the most then of, of this cloud of this cloud the cloud was cigar shaped the cloud was not trapped in the focus of a laser beam the cloud was trapped in a magnetic potential but uh, uh, everything was very uh, very much the same like trapping the inside the laser beam it's also a cigar shaped cloud and the authors of this Nobel Prize paper they noted that expansion of the cloud is very nice atropic. the cigar cigar cloud turned into a disk why this is peculiar let's consider a classical gas inside cigar shaped trap how it would expand a classical gas would expand into a sphere which is very nice round sphere because uh, velocity distribution in a classical gas is completely isotropic and in expansion the size is governed by the velocity distribution so classical gas should become a sphere they clearly, they clearly observed, instead of a sphere, they are getting elliptic flow. They are getting a disk. So this co very compressed direction, it expanded very rapidly. And they wrote in the paper, oh, we see diffraction of, uh, of the wave function. Because uh, uh, in mind, they had a population of the lowest ground state, like in this simple picture. And in this direction is compressed. We know uh, relation delta x delta delta p uh, equals h bar. This direction is compressed. It means there is much bigger delta p in this direction than in this direction. And uh, this uh, uh, qualitatively this agrees with this uh, picture. Th this is a diffraction of the wave function. But. Uh, uh, Shortly after this very nice paper, uh, a gr the group from Kurchatov Institute, uh, Yuri Kagan and uh, his colleagues, they published a paper and uh, uh, noted, look, uh, if you can see the classical gas in the same trap, it can also expand, it can also show this elliptic expansion, but the gas should be interacting interacting approximately like particles in the Bose uh, in that Bose condensate interact 
Indeed, uh, indeed, in this uh, in this 1995 paper, uh, Wieman, Carnell, and others they saw Bose-Einstein condensate, but this anisotropic expansion was not a signature of Bose-Einstein condensation. And this is a po another point to uh, uh, that we have to look deeply into the interactions of uh, of ultra cold particles, and they, we can learn a lot from detailed understanding and control of these interactions.